Aloha. Uh, so for the last 20 years, I've been photographing the Aina of Maui. Aina is a Hawaiian word that means the sacred landscape. And to me, it's everything. Um, that's what I do. My photography has taken me to some amazing places. I've lived with refugees in Afghanistan. I've been with the hill tribes of Papua New Guinea. Um, and I've, I've traveled down the Omo River in Ethiopia's Omo Valley. But there's no place I'd rather call home than here on Maui. Um, from the summit of Haleakala to the depths of our wreaths, there's no place quite as beautiful and as special. Photography for me is, is a brief moment of clarity. It has the chance to teach us things. It, it can be a, a storytelling element. And, and sometimes it can even change our lives. So today I wanted to talk about a few times in my life when photography has changed my life. Um, so this is the first photo. Um, this is the King's Highway. It was built 600 years ago by King Pialani. And it was the first road to circumnavigate an entire island in Polynesia. Every year for 30 years, a Hawaiian man by the name of Eddie Poo would circumnavigate the island of Maui on the King's Highway. He had had a dream where an elder came to him and said that he must protect the Aina by walking the coast of Maui. Eddie did this for every single year of his life, and he became a legend here. Um, he became a kumu, a spiritual elder. And he passed away in 2012. In 2013, I had a calling that I was supposed to walk around the island of Maui. I can't really explain it. So I packed up a backpack with a one-man tent and a sleeping bag and my camera and a lot of water. And I set out for the coast of Maui. And I began walking. And I would camp at night. And I would walk. And I would talk to Hawaiians along the way and ask them what they knew about the King's Highway. Because when Eddie passed away, all knowledge was gone of where it was. There were no books I could find. There was very little knowledge of, of the road. So as I walked, I, I kept getting the same advice. Just look for the blue stones. The blue stones, OK. So. Day six, I have about 100 pounds of gear on my back. And I come to this point, this photo of the King's Highway. This is the very first moment I ever saw the King's Highway. The sun was setting. It was one of the most awesome sunsets I'd ever seen. And, and I finally understood how grand and beautiful this historic monument was. And once you're on the King's Highway, it connects you to ancient Hawaii, it connects you to all the villages. You, you were, it was just a, a portal into what it must have been like for these soldiers of the king to walk this road. And you could see the walls and you could tell it was built for six soldiers to walk shoulder to shoulder around the island. At this moment, I took this photo. I had just run out of water. So the next day, in blazing sun, I got a little nervous because uh, someone had died the year before out here of dehydration. I didn't want to be that guy. So I looked up, and I could see Ulupalakua and the greenness of Ulupalakua above me. And I realized at this moment that I would have to cross the lava fields, leave the King's Highway, and get water. So I hiked two miles straight up over some really sharp lava. And by the time I reached the upper road, I was pretty delirious. I couldn't see straight. And the first car I saw, I stopped. And I said, excuse me, um, do you have any water? And a really familiar voice came from the passenger side. And it was my friend. And she said, Daniel, it's us. We're 
we're bringing you dinner tonight. And I had just happened upon them. They had just been driving down the road, and that was the person I flagged. It was crazy. I didn't even recognize them. So they gave me some water and sent me on my way, and I kept walking. And a couple miles down the road, another friend passed me in his van, and he handed me a fresh coconut out the window as he passed me. So I knew the island was taking care of me. And Maui does take care of you. So I ended up walking 180 miles in 10 days, and I ended up back at my house, and I became obsessed with the King's Highway. Over the next few years, I, I, I read everything I could on it. I, I talked to as many historians, and I, I tried to find what I could. I ended up hiking up into the rainforest of, of Kanai, two miles to find an ancient heiau where the King's Highway went, and it became my first book. And it was this wonderful project, and it really connected me to the Aina. And through this project, I realized this was why I'm here. I'm here to photograph the Aina. And so I was, I just finished the book, and I was in Hana, and I was at a church. And I went to take a break, and I, I sat in the graveyard, and there was a pile of rocks right next to me. So I sat down, and there was a little laminated photo on top of that pile of rocks. And it was of Eddie. And I was sitting right next to Eddie. I had found his resting place. And I thanked him. I had a, a stone that I always carried with me from the King's Highway when I first found it. And I wrapped it in a tea leaf and I, I gave it to Eddie. The poet laureate W.S. Merwin was a friend of mine. Um, he was an amazing writer. And um, he was blind when I was working on this book, but he, he really took a fascination in my project. So on Thanksgiving morning, Paula, his, his wife, um, who they both passed away at this point, um, called me and she said, William wanted to write something for your book. He was blind, but she narrated it to me. And this is what he said. He said, the King's Trail is a legend in stone. The remains of the, origi the original are obliterated in sections. The results of the ravages of time, overgrowth, and the heedless incursions of development, so that the trail that is left has the truncated aspects of ancient statuary. I always liked legend in stone. I thought that was beautiful. So COVID hit. And as everybody who lives here on the island knows, the island completely shut down. We are dependent on tourism. 90% of us, that's how we make our living. Um, and I lost my gallery that I had had for 17 years. And I really didn't know what I was going to do with myself. Um, but I had a calling to start walking the island again. So this time I took my 15-year-old son with me, Tristan. And um, we decided to walk from the summit of Haleakala down to Kaupo through the rainforest. It was completely overgrown at this point. Um, this was the night when we had started. Um, a scientist was driving up the road. And I set up my tripod, and his headlights lit up the road beautifully and lit up the telescopes. And the galactic core was lined up beautifully with uh, the telescope. So it was a good beginning. Um, and we started walking. Clifford Naoli, who is the culture ambassador here at the Ritz-Carlton, um, is, is another hero of mine. And um, I was talking to him about the pandemic, and, and this is what he said. He said, when the pandemic hit, it cleared our eyes, and we realized it was time for us to reconnect to the mountains in the ocean, Mauko de Makai. Everything was revealed to us. We were so busy, we never took the time to see that everything was connected. We saw that the fish were coming back. The waters, streams were running. The birds were flying lower. Maybe it was in front of us the entire time, but we were too blind and too busy to see it. So a silver sword only grows at the summit of Haleakala volcano. It's the only place on the planet a Haleakala silver sword will grow. It takes 20 years for it to bloom. And we were lucky enough to find one behind the new moon. Tristan used his iPhone to, to light it right behind me, which was the perfect blue lighting. It kind of mirrored the moonlight 
Um, so we were really fortunate to, to come across this. I've been teaching classes and, and doing private workshops here on photography for the last decade. And one of the most important lessons that I learned along the King's Highway was photograph what's in your backyard. And it's what I always tell my students. Photograph what's in your backyard. It's what you're going to know best. So it's going to be closest to you, and it's what you're going to know better than anyone else. This is literally my backyard. It was 2 AM, and I live right under the Holy Ghost Church, which is the oldest wooden church in all of Hawaii. It's up in Kola. And it was misting, and I couldn't sleep. So I, I, I walked outside, and there was a full moon behind me. And as I looked up, there was a perfect moon bow over the Holy Ghost Church. I'd never seen a moon bow. It was beautiful. So I grabbed my camera, and I was like, don't, don't, don't go anywhere. Um, but always be prepared. When I was working on this book, I, I, I really got sucked into the big wave surfing world. Um, I photographed it from the cliff, from a jet ski, from the water. But my favorite way to photograph it is from a helicopter. Um, this is Kai Lenny, who's probably the best surfer in the world today. We shot this from a doorless helicopter. We actually flew about the height of the lip of the wave that was about you know close to 100 feet. And Kai had just done a 360 out of the wave. So it was this amazing moment. The sun had just risen and lit him up. And uh, it was beautiful. So um, yeah, it was a really cool moment. But I love shooting big waves. And that's part of my, my Malcolm Mackay, my new book I was shooting. I, I wanted to include that because it was a new aspect of my photography. I always love photography because it, it gives you the ability to reinvent yourself over and over again. I've gone from a photojournalist shooting refugees in Afghanistan, to photographing landscape, to photographing big waves, to photographing underwater and astrophotography. So photography has so many different facets. So some photos take longer than others. Um, Neo Weiss comment only passes our planet every 6,792 years. I, it was the peak of the shutdown, and I wanted to get a shot of the comet. And I, I've been kind of racking my brain, you know, well, what could I put in front of the comet? And I was like, well, maybe if I go to Ho'okipa, I'll get a couple turtles. So I set up my tripod, and sure enough, I was there early. Two turtles came up. I was like, OK, great. And then four turtles came up, and then 12, 24, 48, 100. 100 turtles at least, came up that night. It was a cosmic event. And I was able to get the comet behind them. And as I was shooting them, the park patrol started yelling at me that I wasn't allowed to be on the beach. And I just ignored them. I couldn't, couldn't hear them. Because you know some shots are worth the wait. And I, I wasn't going to get this chance again. Um, so I free dive. Um, it's one of the things I love to do here. And I was off Maluaka Point on the south side. And I saw these two turtles circling each other. And I'd never seen behavior like this. So I balled up really small. And I held my breath the longest I've ever held my breath. It was the longest breath hold I'd ever had. And they completely forgot I was there. And they were mating. And this moment he came up to bite her ear, it was, that was the shot for me. I don't know how interested she was, but <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's all about that, that moment, that, that brief moment of clarity that photography allows you that can transcend time. Um, so I'm always looking for the moment. This is uh, a traffic jam here in Maui. It's as bad as it gets for us right here. But you know, it's about symmetry, you know? Like I, I, I love shooting the turtles here, but this photo for me, I love the tracks on the left and the symmetry of the turtles in the middle and the, the water, so. So this is whale tails, and I wanted to share some of my work um, photographing the whale migration. Uh, this is one of the biggest comp pods that I've come across. Um, this was last year. 
uh, in McKenna, but it was a, a fantastic compound. So this week is, is an anniversary for me. Um, three years ago, when I was working on my first book, my son and I decided to go out and photograph the whale migration. Um, these photos right here, I took three days uh, on Monday, so a few days ago. Um, we had a Kona day. And it reminded me so much of the day that Tristan and I took our kayak out. But we took the helicopter this week over to Lanai. And the waters were like a lake. I've never seen such clarity. It was like we were in an aquarium. And we could see the whales coming up to breach from 20 feet down. So it was just this amazing day. You know, I just, it was beautiful. Uh, you don't get many days like that you know, when the ocean just becomes glass. Um, but yeah, so I've been photographing the whales here for many years. Um, this was this week. It was just perfect. So three years ago, Tristan and I left Ukamehame Beach. It was an epic day. It was so beautiful. We took our two-man kayak out, and we, it was, as anyone knows who's gotten to go on a whale watch this week, the whales are everywhere. I mean, it was such a great week, and it, it felt like this year during the year that the COVID shutdown happened, uh, there were more whales because there were no boats. They were just everywhere. So we paddled out, and um, close to two miles out, we saw some dolphins jumping three dolphins, and then we saw a mother and a calf and an escort. And they, they, they came right up to the boat. It was awesome. The dolphin were jumping. And the mother kept lifting the calf up to the boat. It was almost like she was showing us her calf. It was, it was beautiful. And um, I put my housing over the side of the kayak, and I took this shot. And the escort whale, right after I took this shot, he swam in between us, and he, he stretched his pectoral fin almost out to touch the kayak. But it was really mysterious. It was almost like he was saying, you need to go. <laughs> so I said to Tristan, I, this calf was just born. This calf is, is so, I mean, it, you could see there was, if you look closely in this photo, you can actually see stuff in the water. There was like, stuff in the water. And I said, Tristan, we got to we got to leave these guys alone. Let's 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 go. So, I put my housing in my lap. And not 20 seconds after I had grabbed my paddle, we got hit. And it was like we'd been hit by a truck. And 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 the first thing that went through my mind was, "Oh my god, that escort just breached on us." We flew out of the water. Tristan went flying off the front of the boat, but I didn't. I was in the back, and when I looked down, it was the jaws of a white shark. And it was just an inch on both sides of my legs, cracking down on the kayak. His teeth locked in the kayak, and then he flew over, and I landed on top of him. Somehow, I was still holding on to my paddle, and instinctively, I started to hit him, and he went down. So I yelled at Tristan, Tristan, there's a shark. Get in the boat. And he thought the whale had breached us as well because he'd flown off the front. He had grabbed my camera housing because he saw it floating. So as we went to pull the kayak over, we saw the crater that the shark had left in the bottom of the boat. And the boat sank. So now we're laying on top of the boat. I'm on top of Tristan, and, and the boat's under the water. So it's not really doing us much good. And I said to Tristan, we're going to have to swim. And he's like, well, can't we call someone? I was like, we're two miles out in the Pacific. We got to swim. So we started swimming. And I started counting out cadence. I would, I would count our strokes. And I'd say, all right, one, 
two, three, and we count to 10. And I say, okay, take a breath. And we count 10 more. And, and Tristan, luckily, is 6'2". He's on the swim team. He's a big, strong boy. So he was keeping me afloat as much as I was keeping him afloat. And about a quarter mile in, a boat passed between us and where our kayak was, and it slowed down to look at us. And we yelled, help, it's a shark, help. And they didn't stop. They took off. And we were heartbroken. I mean, honestly, like the shark, I don't take the, what the shark did personally at all. Like he was definitely going after the calf. I know that. But the humans that should have stopped, that broke my heart. So we kept swimming, and a while longer, we looked down and we saw the reef, and we knew we were going to be okay, and we, we came ashore, and I was so proud of my son. It was kind of like a, a coming of manhood for him. Um, he was so brave, and, uh, you know, we'll always have that moment together. Um, this is our kayak. You can see the bite mark right under where I was sitting. Um, they did DNA testing on, on the kayak, too. There was some DNA. August 8th. I live in Kula. It was the first day of school. It was the next day for my, my seven-year-old son. And uh, we had taken his supplies down. And as we were driving back up, I noticed all the trees were broken. Every single branch on every single tree as we came home was broken. I'd never seen anything like it. It was a hurricane, but it was a dry hurricane. We had had a drought for eight months. The island was so dry. Um, I saw plumes of smoke rising as the sun set, and, and, and pretty soon we were surrounded by fire. Um, we had three separate fires burning just in Kula. I had one that this one, this huge one, um, there was one above us, and then there was one in the cane fields coming up towards us. Uh, I sat up on my roof that night watching, not quite sure how I was going to get out because there were so many branches broken, the roads were blocked. We had no electricity, so my family was asleep, and I had the car packed. My neighbor was a retired fireman. So we sat up, and we talked all night, and he said, OK, so you see where that fire is? It's on the gulch. If it jumps the gulch, we got to drive through the neighbor's yard to get out of here. And at 2 AM, something crazy happened. The wind shifted, completely shifted, and blew the fire down the mountain. And our house was, was saved. I got a call from Haleakala Ranch the next day that they had a huge fire um, that was burning, and they wanted me to document it. So I drove the truck up, and, and I went out with some local firefighters who were volunteers to document them fighting the fire. And it was about noon that day when we got the call that Lahaina was gone. And all these firefighters had grown up here. You know, these were local guys. They're called the Paniolo firefighters. And everybody was just shattered. And then we, we realized that thousands of people had lost their homes. And, it was the, the worst wildfire in 100 years in US history. And we never expected this for our island. Um, and we've had so many friends that were, were affected. But the community response for me has been the one thing that is the most beautiful thing that we can pull from this fire. This is September 8th. And we were still just in a daze. And we had this paddle, paddle out where thousands of surfers came together. This is what we do when there's a memorial. When someone we love dies, we have a paddle out. And um, this was the biggest one in history. And um, Tristan paddled out. And I sat on the beach because I wanted to document it from above. So this is the video from the paddle out. Oops, sorry. Let me see if that'll play. Oh, come on. Okay.
So that's Aloha. That's our Aloha right there. And um, I'm going to just leave you with one final quote from Clifford. He said, people move to the island and see it through their eyes. But in actuality, the island is watching you. And after a certain point, if you're still here, the island will put its hand upon you and say, I choose you to accept this kuleana. You don't choose the island. The island chooses you. The island gives you the responsibility. The island gives you the love. It's up to you to make sure it happens. And when it does happen, your legacy begins. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.